Don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. This mythical order, given to the soldiers manning the Breed's Hill defenses just before the start of the Battle of Bunker Hill, has reverberated throughout American history. In the face of overwhelming odds, this ragtag army of freedom-loving Americans stood tall and valiantly repulsed the professional British forces that assailed their positions. For better or worse, the Battle of Bunker Hill and the Whites of Their Eyes order has come to symbolize the inevitable triumph of American freedom over British tyranny. These words, which have long since become ingrained in American popular memory, were likely spoken that day by General Israel Old Put Putnam, the most famous soldier in the 13 colony. Welcome to America's Forgotten Founders, where we will look at people whose contributions to the American Revolution, whether on the battlefield, in the halls of power, or on the home front, have been all but forgotten by the annals of history. Israel Putnam was born on January 7, 1718, in Salem Village, which was then part of the province of Massachusetts Bay. He was the 11th of 12 children of Joseph and Elizabeth Putnam. His parents were devout Puritans who had firmly opposed the infamous witch trials in Salem during the 1690s. We know very little about Israel's parents or what kind of childhood he had. Despite Puritans typically providing their children with a well-rounded education, Israel received little formal schooling. As one of his biographers described his formative years, school terms were short in Salem Village and books were few. Israel spent what time could be spared from farm work and school in the woods and the fields. The young boy would prefer to be out and about, climbing trees to gather eggs from bird nests and catching fish from the nearby river. Mother Nature, let's say, was his tutor. In 1739, Israel married 18-year-old Hannah Pope. The couple would remain together until Hannah died in 1765. They'd have five sons and five daughters. A year after tying the knot, the newlyweds left Salem and set out for the small town of Pomfret in northeastern Connecticut. There, they began building their new life together, determined to carve out their own future. By all accounts, Israel was an incredibly successful farmer. He was strong, hard-working, and utterly fearless. This last trait would be the hallmark of the great future general. In 1743, the adventurous, hard-working Putnam would personally kill the last wolf in Connecticut, earning him the nickname Old Wolf Putnam from his jubilant neighbors. He developed quite a reputation for this feat of heroism. He allegedly crawled 25 feet through a narrow tunnel into the wolf's den before shooting or possibly strangling the sleeping wolf. Putnam spent the better part of the next decade building one of the most prosperous farms in the Mortlake District. Despite lacking a formal education, Israel proved to be a skillful manager. Perhaps this is where Israel Putnam could have faded into historical obscurity. A well-to-do farmer in the Connecticut countryside whose largest claim to fame was killing a wolf. But history would not allow that. When Connecticut began recruiting men to serve in the French and Indian War, it should be of little surprise that the 37-year-old Putnam was one of the first men to answer the call, leaving his wife and children behind. While Putnam began the conflict as a lowly private, he would rise to the rank of colonel by the time the fighting stopped. He began his service in Rogers Rangers, perhaps the most infamous unit of the entire conflict. While we, for the sake of time, won't go into too much detail on Putnam's service during the French and Indian War, it's definitely something we recommend you look up to get a better understanding of Old Putt. We highly recommend starting with Robert Hubbard's excellent work, Major General Israel Putnam, Hero of the American Revolution. For our sake, we're only going to discuss Putnam's service in Rogers Rangers, 
The Rangers would serve as elite light infantry, conducting reconnaissance missions deep into the Canadian wilderness. From his time in the Rangers, Putnam learned much about low-intensity warfare. He also studied the tactics of his adversaries. In an attempt to prepare his men for combat, the unit's commander, Major Robert Rogers, would compile a list of his 28 rules of ranging. Rule 13, which many argue influenced the infamous whites of their eyes order, reads as follows. In general, when pushed upon by the enemy, reserve your fire till they approach very near, which will then put them into the greater surprise and consternation, and give you an opportunity of rushing upon them with your hatchets and cutlasses to the better advantage. All that said, then, it'll be sufficient to say that Putnam served with distinction throughout the war, fighting admirably as a soldier and officer from the shores of Lake Champlain in upstate New York to the battlements of Morro Castle in Havana, Cuba, earning several wounds and developing a reputation as a fearless leader of men. He emerged from the conflict as one of the most famous men in British North America. He was nothing less than a living legend. Shortly after Colonel Putnam left the military in late 1764, his beloved Hannah passed away. Israel was devastated. Never a man of faith, Israel would turn to God to cope with Hannah's loss, joining the Brooklyn Congregational Church in 1765. For two years, the hardened, battle-tested soldier raised seven children alone. The youngest was just three months old. Throughout this time, he became increasingly involved with his church, attending Mass regularly. By 1772, he was managing the church's affairs. A little more than two years after Hannah's death, on June 3, 1767, Israel Putnam married his second wife, the wealthy and highly cultured widow Deborah Gardiner. Likely at her insistence, Israel soon gave the Putnam farmstead to his eldest son, 27-year-old Israel, and moved with Deborah to Brooklyn. The two would quickly transform their home into the General Wolf Inn. In one contemporary's words, the business, with its distinguished host and equally cordial hostess, quickly became one of the best-known gathering places in eastern Connecticut. Despite never being entirely comfortable with his celebrity status, Israel Putnam was not a man to take anything lying down. When Parliament instituted the Stamp Act on March 22, 1765, Old Wolf quickly became one of the Act's most outspoken opponents. He ultimately convinced Connecticut Governor Thomas Fitch not to enforce the Stamp Act. Granted, he did so by threatening the governor that his house would be leveled with the dust in five minutes if he refused to follow his advice. In large part due to his public opposition to the Stamp Act, Putnam began serving in a wide variety of public offices at the insistence of his fellow citizens. Here is how one of his biographers described his public service. He devised and laid out roads, he set out school districts, he deliberated upon the great question whether to repair or pull down the meeting house, nor did he disdain to hire the master, seat the meeting house, collect parish rates, nor even to receive crow's heads and pay out the bounty money. As the storm clouds began to gather over the colonies in 1774, Israel Putnam assumed ever greater responsibility. He served on Connecticut's Committee of Correspondence. He was also appointed a colonel in the Connecticut militia. By this time, in sharp contrast to many of his fellow citizens, Israel Putnam was ready for war. He wrote that if the colony's dispute with the crown could not be settled peacefully, he was ready to march in the vanguard and to sprinkle the American altars with our heart's blood if occasion should be. Powerful, well-written words for a man with no formal education. Before the revolution began, and we cannot stress this point enough, Putnam was, without a doubt, one of, if not the most, famous man in the colonies. Only the inventor, doctor, printer, diplomat, 
and notorious womanizer Benjamin Franklin was his equal. Many patriots already refer to him as the old hero, the old wolf, and old putt, and this was before the revolution began. In the days to come, Putnam would certainly live up to his reputation. Putnam first heard about the Battle of Lexington and Concord while helping his eldest at the family farm. As soon as he heard the news, old Putt literally came off the plow, saddled his horse, and, in his grimy, dirt-covered clothes, rode to Governor Jonathan Trumbull's house. The governor instructed Putnam to go to Boston and offer his services. This he did right away, riding over 100 miles in 18 hours. After he learned the British had withdrawn back to Boston, he returned to Connecticut and, with the permission of Governor Trumbull, levied a regiment and set out for Boston again to join General Artemis Ward. At this very early stage of the revolution, the Patriot movement had no organization. Everything was haphazard and improvised. After the Battle of Lexington and Concord, General Artemis Ward, the newly appointed commander of the Massachusetts militia, laid siege to Boston while in command of the provisionally authorized Army of Observation. General Putnam linked his forces with General Ward amid this chaos and confusion. While, of course, George Washington would become ultimately the hero of the American Revolution, in these early days, General Putnam was very much the figurehead of the Revolution. To the inexperienced men congregating around Boston, he was a near-mythical figure. A legendary warrior who had bravely and stoically defended his people in the past. And when his people were once again in danger, he rose from his slumber to fight alongside them again in their hour of need. It should be of little surprise that the lowly born, poorly educated, and vulgar Putnam, whose body was adorned with the scars of a lifetime of hardship and combat, was easily the provincial army's most beloved officer. His son Daniel, perhaps with a bit of embellishment, recounted his father's effect on the men like this. His popularity was not confined to Connecticut, but pervaded the whole of the Massachusetts forces then before Boston, and there was not a soldier in their ranks but seemed ready to follow him, to fight for him, and if need be, to die by his side. Putnam would soon show everyone he had plenty of fight left in him. At Noddle Island, he led his men in a skirmish against some British Marines and their accompanying schooner. The Marines would be routed and the schooner plundered and burnt. Putnam was so adored by the soldiers and the public alike that newspapers across the colonies heralded him as their savior. One of the newspapers published this poem about Putnam. Pure mass of courage, every soldier's wonder. Unto the field he steps, enrobed with martial thunder. Tears up the elements and rends the earth asunder. Nature designed him for the field of battle, unused to statesmen's wiles or courtiers' prattle. Mars-like, his chief delights, where thundering cannon rattle. For all his bravado and military skill, Putnam was not a patient man. He, along with Colonel William Prescott, convinced General Ward to take an aggressive stance and fortify two hills overlooking Boston. Under the recommendation of General Putnam, Breed's Hill, not the larger Bunker Hill, was chosen as the linchpin of the American defenses. As soon as the American troops arrived at Breed's Hill during the night of June 16, 1775, they began fortifying the position. By morning, they came under fire from British ships. Despite being under sporadic fire, the Americans had erected an impressive breastwork by midday. While the American troops prepared for the assault they knew was coming, General Putnam, strolling amongst his men, reportedly reminded his men, You are all marksmen. Don't one of you fire until you see the whites of their eyes. It's also believed Putnam ordered his troops to aim at the handsome coats, pick off the commanders, and his men listened. 
in the coming battle, a staggering 134 British officers would be killed or wounded. When the battle began, we don't know precisely what General Putnam did. Some men claimed to have seen him in action at the rain fence, at the breastwork, and behind the redoubt. They saw him on horseback amidst the flying balls. While such a romantic portrayal fits neatly with Putnam's well-established reputation, it appears he spent most of the day in the rear attempting to rally other units to join in the fighting. Putnam, unafraid to take the lead, recognized that his role as overall commander required him to direct the disorganized chaos of his inexperienced army's first battle with the British. To this end, Putnam tried to issue commands to inexperienced officers and even less experienced men, often to no avail. He tried to rally men who were gripped by fear. He also tried in vain, to coordinate with General Ward to get his men more powder and shot as supplies began running dangerously low. Eventually, when the Patriots ran out of ammunition during the third British assault, the men were forced to withdraw. Despite his best efforts, the old general was unable to rally the men to form ranks on Bunker Hill. While the British ultimately took the ground, they paid a heavy price. Each inch of the battlefield was soaked in British blood. While Bunker Hill would not be Putnam's last battle, it marked the high watermark of his public and military career during the American Revolution. After the Battle of Bunker Hill, when the Continental Congress created the Continental Army, Israel Putnam was unanimously appointed as one of the three major generals under George Washington. Putnam and Washington were the only two general officers to receive unanimous confirmation from Congress. General Putnam continued serving as Washington's right-hand man for the next two years. He commanded troops at the Siege of Boston. The bold, reckless man proved ill-suited, though, to oversee a siege. A man of action, Putnam once angrily stormed out during a meeting with General Washington. After the city fell, Largely due to the efforts of his cousin, Rufus Putnam, Israel accompanied his men to New York City. His men were decisively defeated during the disastrous Battle of Long Island. The defeat was so complete that his men were almost completely cut off from Washington's army and in danger of being surrounded. In the end, however, his fearsome reputation may have saved him and his army from capitulation or annihilation. The overall commander of the British forces, General Howe, was afraid to commit his men in open battle against the Putnam of Bunker Hill and Rogers Rangers fame. After successfully managing the improbable retreat, Putnam and George Washington attempted to rally the militia at Kipps Bay, when Howe finally decided to attack. Despite both men riding amongst the men, urging them to stand and fight alongside them, the militia kept on running. He continued to serve under Washington, fighting admirably in the Battle of White Plain and Princeton. He would also use his heroic status to drive recruitment efforts in Connecticut. But Putnam's military service would come to an abrupt end. While traveling to Valley Forge in December 1779, Putnam suffered a debilitating stroke that left him partially paralyzed for the rest of his life. Despite his military career coming to an immediate end, Putnam remained in good spirits. He continued to enjoy the simple pleasures in life, good food, good drink, and good company. And despite his disability, on more than one occasion, he'd make the arduous journey to Washington's camp to raise the spirit of the men and officers alike in the darkest days of the Revolution. The friendly, amenable old hero would raise the spirits of everyone he talked with, from the commander-in-chief to the lowest private. Washington would continue corresponding regularly with Old Putt until the latter's death on May 29, 1790, at the age of 72. Israel Putnam was a soldier's general. In a world where social connections and education were everything, he rose all the way from private to major general with just three months of formal education. 
and with no political benefactors to ensure his rise. His rags-to-riches tale embodied what was possible for all men in the new United States. Plus, his humble origins, his rough demeanor, and his many battle scars earned him not only the respect, but the admiration of the men beneath him. As for his legacy as a military commander, I think it's pretty safe to say he was a gifted leader of men who was thrust into an almost impossible situation. While he may not have had much experience commanding an army, his army had no experience either being an army. His strong character alone held his troops together. While contemporaries have often chastised him as largely inept in broader strategic level issues, this categorization, I think, is largely unfair. I'd like to turn to the following two conversations between General Putnam and his fellow officers. For one who was not supposed to be much of a strategic thinker, in some cases he was more prescient than his fellow generals. In discussion with Joseph Warren and General Artemis Ward before the Battle of Bunker Hill, Putnam advocated aggressive action against the British. Ward replied that, as peace and reconciliation is what we seek for, would it not be better to act only on the defensive and give no unnecessary provocation? Putnam then turned to Warren and said with emphasis, You know, Dr. Warren, we shall have no peace worth anything till we gain it by the sword. On another occasion, Washington and a group of generals were dining together. During the evening, Washington offered the following toast, a speedy and honorable peace. A few days later, while entertaining Washington at his own headquarters, General Putnam offered a far different toast, a long and moderate war. I'll let our sources take it from here. It has been truly said of Washington that he seldom smiled and almost never laughed, but the sober and sententious manner in which Putnam delivered his sentiment and its seeming contradiction to all his practice came so unexpectedly upon Washington that he did laugh more heartily than ever I remember to have seen him before or after. But presently he said, You are the last man, General Putnam, for whom I should have expected such a toast. You who are always urging vigorous measures to plead now for a long, and what is still more extraordinary, a moderate war. It seems strange indeed. Putnam replied to Washington that, the measures I advised were calculated to prevent, not to hasten, a peace, which would only be a rotten thing and last no longer than it divided us. I expect nothing but a long war, and I would have it a moderate one, that we may hold out till the mother country becomes willing to cast us off forever. That is a fairly impressive and prescient argument from a man whom many of his contemporaries lambasted as inept, uneducated, and a poor strategic thinker. If there is one lesson to take away from General Israel Putnam's life, perhaps it's this idiom to never judge a book by its cover. I hope you found this video both informative and exciting. Make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. And join us next time as we look at our next forgotten figures, two of the many African-American soldiers at Bunker Hill, Barzilai Lu and Salem Poor.